Ну, вы как предпочитаете по-русски или по-английски говорить? Я предпочел бы по-английски на самом деле. То есть, а, ну, а, да, да, пожалуй, Нет проблем. Нет проблем. Um, Хорошо, тогда я запустил запись. Тимофей, пожалуйста. So, this, uh, давайте я вначале скажу по-русски, так сказать, мне uh, немножко страшно давать этот доклад перед людьми, которые честно, честно, честно занимаются геометрической теорией представлений. Я... Секунду, тут, тут люди еще подошли, <laughs> хотят присоединиться. Сейчас я можешь сказать что-нибудь, мы слышим, чтобы понять, мы слышим или нет? Ну, да, я, я вот говорю, то есть я просто хочу понять, когда... То есть не скажите, когда можно уже дальше говорить, Джейн. Скажи мне, когда, так сказать, uh -huh. вот, уляжет, то тут просто шумно. Кофеем, мы слышим, а от тебя идет сильный шум. От кого-то идет сильный шум. Вот, Хорошо. шумущий. Хорошо. Отлично. Ну так вот, просто перед тем, как э, начать э, давать доклад на английском, хотел бы предварить его... Э, так сказать, предупреждением, что э, я изначально алгебраический геометр, и э, в эту часть своей деятельности, которая очень сильно ограничена с геометрической э, теорией представления, был, так сказать, вовлечен постепенно, случайно, и благодаря э, плохому влиянию моей соавтора Ширины Анно. Э, и э, давать доклад перед прямо честными э, людьми, занимающиеся геометрическими представлениями, немного страшно, поэтому если я где-нибудь буду говорить глупости, вы меня немедленно поправляете. Но э, глупости я буду, возможно, говорить, в, объясняя общий бэкграунд всего происходящего. Когда мы дойдем до того, чем мы сейчас занимаемся, там никаких глупостей не будет. Я надеюсь. So, uh, this talk, uh, firstly, I sort of apologize for this being a slight talk. I usually uh, Uh, prefer giving blackboard talks even on Zoom. However, as you will see, there are too many diagrams here uh, to, for me to be able to give this in real time and hope uh, to get anywhere near the end of the story. So the talk is about skin triangulated representations of generalized braids. And I'll spend the uh, first part of the talk explaining more or less every uh, word in this title. Also, uh, I have to say that this is a talk which tries to present the sort of the, the, the big project that myself and my collaborator, Rina Anno, whom this is all joint work with, have been working on for the last 10 years. I mean, we've uh, done various things. We've done theory of spherical functors, theory of PN functors. We've, we're now working on bar back for DG categories, but all of this in one way or another fit in uh, into this project. Uh, so even though I'll spend a lot of talk explaining what generalized braids are, uh, and you know this will be the big technical definition in the middle of the talk, uh, the really important part and the sort of the real bit where I think we contribute to the current state of knowledge is with this notion of skein triangulated. So to explain, I mean, triangulated, it's as in triangulated categories, uh, and skein refers to the skein relation uh, used in sort of a knot theory. And uh, I would like first to sort of to remind of what Uh, the skin relation is, and in some sense, where historically this whole story begins. Just testing. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Can you see my screen okay? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Good. So let's uh, sort of start with Jones polynomial, which uh, uh, was uh, defined by Vaughan Jones in 1985, and I believe eventually got him a Fields medal. So uh, this is a polynomial invariant of oriented links. So uh, if I remember right, uh, a knot uh, is a sort of, uh, is a 
topological configuration you can make out of one string and link is uh, potentially uh, a bunch of nodes. So it's a topological configuration you can make from several strings. Uh, and uh, oriented means we choose orientation on each string. Now, uh, if you want to define an invariant of links, you, you want to define something that doesn't change uh, as you continuously deform the links. So something that's invariant up to um, isotopy. And uh, it boils down usually to defining something on a plane that, I mean, if you have a link, which is a, by definition, sort of a three-dimensional configuration, you can take a projection of it onto a plane. You would get a sort of a planar projection of a link. Uh, so here is a simple one, for example. This is actually uh, just the same link as this. Only you, only we projected uh, sort of, in a, so we bend it a little and projected in a strange way, which uh, ends up giving this. And uh, there is, there is uh, a theorem by Reidemeister, which says that if you have two planar projections of two isotopic links, then they can be related uh, by sequence of uh, sort of three moves, uh, three transformations of diagrams plus isotopy of diagrams. So the three moves are Reidemeister one, which sort of untwists uh, configuration like this into a configuration like this. Uh, a poke, which uh, slides a string from under uh, sort of a hook uh, like this. And uh, what's called a pitchfork move or a slide move, which slides a string through uh, intersection. The reason behind this is actually uh, quite simple. Uh, when we talk about planar projections, we disallow any cusps and we disallow uh, any uh, triple intersections. So then we, if we have a planar diagram, we can do, we can do any isotopy to it as long as it doesn't pass through this forbidden sort of things. And what all these three moves correspond to are precisely, you know, you could not get from this configuration to this configuration without uh, moving the string through the intersection point here. And at that point, you will be at that sort of forbidden planar projection, which doesn't exist in the sort of in the category of allowed planar projections of links. Same thing uh, sort of here, you couldn't do this without ending up with a cusp uh, and, sa and same thing here, you couldn't do this without uh, uh, these two uh, strings, just sort of uh, the, pla the planar projection sort of just forming uh, uh, point where these two touch. So Reidemeister moves just come, come from, uh, from this forbidden planar projection, which you must somehow jump over. Uh, and you can't if you just consider isotopies of planar projections. But the point of this all is that uh, if to define a polynomial invariant of oriented links, it's enough to define, uh, to assign it to any planar diagram representing the link, and then prove that it's invariant under Reidemeister moves then you've got something that sort of doesn't change uh, as independent of a planar projection, you choose an isotopy of the link. So to define Jones polynomial, you first define something called a uh, scaled Kaufman bracket. And uh, this is a sort of a bit embarrassing because I'll be talking about two different scalings. The definition I follow is not the original Kaufman's definition. In Kaufman's definition, for example, uh, these two parts are symmetric, uh, but it's a sort of a scaled version of it defined by Hovanov in his work uh, because he uh, needed this relation to look exactly like this. And for the same reason, as you will see, as him, I also needed to look exactly like this. So I take the original Kaufman bracket and I change this definition a bit. What I get is the following, uh, the following uh, rule. It assigns to any planar diagram a uh, polynomial in uh, Laurent polynomial in Q, which are two, uh, what's called an unknot, just a circle like this. We assign Q plus Q minus one to a disjoint union of two uh, planar, proje uh, planar projections. We assign the product of the polynomials uh, we would assign to each of them individually. And then to any crossing like, to any sort of crossing like this, we assign 
uh, I mean, what happens here is I say, suppose, I mean, uh, what do I mean by Tony crossing like this? Suppose I have a link. Suppose at some uh, place in the link, in the planar diagram representing a link, I have this uh, crossing. Then I'm saying that what I, the polynomial assigned to the link, which has this crossing somewhere, is the polynomial I assign to the same link, but where this crossing is replaced by this sort of cup and cap, uh, minus Q times the polynomial uh, I would assign to the same link, but with this crossing replaced by this sort of um, vertical cup and cap. Uh, clearly, if I have any link, no matter how complicated, uh, if I can break up any crossing into uh, these two configurations, I can eventually reduce any link to a disjoint union of a bunch of circles. Uh, and uh, I know what to assign to each circle and I know what to assign to a disjoint union of things. So these three rules are enough to assign a polynomial to any, for the moment, unoriented link. So I start, I start by forgetting orientation on my sort of, I take a planar projection and forget about orientation. I obtain a, this, three rules obtain a polynomial sort of F. Uh, I mean, and the only real, I mean, the, this rule is sort of uh, obvious. This is essentially normalization. So the only real rule that uh, governs this invariant is this original skin relation rule. What I obtain is uh, a polynomial F, which uh, is invariant under right master moves two and three, and non-invariant under uh, Rademeister move one. So it is not yet invariant of links because uh, it's at the moment just uh, an invariant of, a, of sort of all these planar diagrams. Uh, I will do an example of, of this all in a moment. I also like to draw your attention to the fact that uh, if you think in terms of braids, then these two, these two moves essentially tell us uh, that uh, we've got a representation uh, of braid group because this tells you that sort of, oh yeah, uh, I have to say that if you've got, uh, instead of over crossing, sort of under crossing uh, in this direction, then you change, uh, then these two guys change places. It's, uh, it's this one minus Q times this one. So anyway, uh, so this just tells us that overcrossing is the inverse of undercrossing. And this is the famous braid relation. Ti, uh, Ti plus one, uh, Ti is uh, Ti plus one, uh, Ti, Ti plus one. So uh, this also sort of uh, tells us that if uh, the this scan relation is already sort of enough to, uh, if, you, if you want to work with braids as opposed to just, uh, as, as opposed to sort of uh, links and tangles. But anyway. To make this invariant under Rademeister, under Rademeister move one, I do uh, the scaling, the sort of the scaling pr pr proposed by Kaufman. Uh, what I do is I take my polynomial F. I remember suddenly that I had an orientation on, uh, on my uh, planar diagram. And I count all the crossings of this form and all the crossings of this form. I look sort of uh, where, uh, on the orientation of the crossing, I sort of, I rotate the crossing upwards and I sort of consider it as either a uh, crossing of this type or, or of this type, depending on which uh, of these two uh, lines is at the top. And then I uh, scale by, mul by multiplying F by Q to the power of uh, YL minus two XL and minus one to the power of XL. Uh, at this point, it would be good to do an example. And then and the, what I would get then is uh, sort of, uh, is the uh, Kaufman, uh, uh, Kaufman's bracket. And here's an example of how it works. Suppose I want to compute uh, the Kaufman bracket of this planar diagram. Then I can resolve this crossing. So the polynomial assigned to this crossing is the polynomial I assigned to the uh, diagram where I replace this crossing by cup and cap minus Q times the polynomial I assigned to this crossing uh, where this is replaced by sort of two vertical strands. So what I, this is just uh, an unknot, so it's Q plus Q minus one. This is two unknots, so it's Q plus Q minus one squared times Q. 
rearranging the terms. If I bring Q plus Q minus one out, uh, what I would get is uh, one minus Q squared uh, uh, plus uh, one uh, minus Q squared plus one. So I would get minus Q squared times Q plus Q minus one. So this is not invariant under Rider Master one because Rider Master one, of course, here it is, turns this directly into unknot, and you know unknot uh, has uh, the polynomial q plus q minus one, and here I have this nasty minus q squared. But what I do now is I uh, assign orientation to it. I mean, suppose this originally had an orientation like this, and I was computing uh, the Kaufman bracket of this uh, oriented link, planar, this planar projection, this oriented link. Then uh, the number of uh, x l the number of these crossings is uh, one, number YL is zero. So I would get that uh, the Kaufman bracket of this link is the uh, Kaufman bracket of this unoriented thing, the scale Kaufman bracket times Q to the power of zero minus uh, two times minus one to the power of one. This cancels minus Q squared here and I'm left with the same uh, um, polynomial assigned to not. So the statement is then that uh, this um, Kaufman bracket I get here is something that is uh, uh, invariant of oriented links uh, because it, 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 it so it's not just invariant and right master moves two and three it's also invariant and right master move one. Uh, and then Jones polynomial is simply uh, a rescaling. I mean. To, to obtain Jones polynomial just uh, the same as uh, it was in Jones' original paper, you simply set uh, uh, Q to be uh, minus T to the power of one half and normalize by dividing by Q plus Q to the power of minus one. So Jones polynomial of uh, unknot is one, for example. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, uh, is it why the word bracket is used here? Uh, because uh, this, uh, for some strange reason, in the original papers, uh, this guy was called Kaufman bracket. Yes, and uh, bracket. So, I mean, is there some reason why uh, he, he called it bracket? So. Uh, I, if there was, uh, I don't remember it. I, I I've, re I've read the original papers, but uh, I've read them a while ago. So mm -hmm. I don't remember why, why it was called a bracket. I mean, one thing I do remember is that Kaufman actually uh, said, suppose we have any linear relation between these three guys, where you have some coefficient here in sort of in, in some polynomial in QQ minus one, here some polynomial in QQ minus one, and here some polynomial in QQ minus one. What uh, must you, what must these coefficients be for the result to be invariant under uh, all three Reitermeister moves? And he arrives to the conclusion that it must be this scale relation. Thank you. So, but as I said, I don't remember why brackets, sorry. Uh, so this is the first part uh, of this story. So uh, the upshot of it is that if you want to assign uh, a polynomial invariant to uh, sort of oriented links, then uh, it's entirely governed by this one relation called skin relation and sort of, uh, and a C, so be, because any link can be reduced to something very simple, in our case, a bunch of unknots uh, using this relation. So next part of the, so before I proceed- Excuse so, me. Um, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask, so is it true that well, the set of polynomials that you can obtain as Jones polynomials is like very restricted? So for an arbitrary polynomial, an arbitrary polynomial most, most likely does not appear as a Jones polynomial of some knot uh, of some good, link. Good question. Uh, Probably, uh, yeah, probably this is correct. Uh, I mean, uh, intuitively it feels right. However, I wouldn't be able to say, to say this exactly again, because uh, as I warned in the very beginning, I'm not uh, sort of a specialist in, uh, in not theory. I need this uh, background to explain uh, why are we uh, worried about higher analogs of skin relation, but uh, 
uh, as you will see for ASCII and relation is uh, something slightly different uh, in the world of okay. triangulated categories. So sorry, I don't know the answer to that question, but uh, just from thinking about this for five seconds, uh, I think that uh, the set of polynomials is very restricted, yes. Okay, thanks. So next part of the story is categorification of Jones polynomial. I think this is how the paper actually Call is called by Mikhail Hovanov in around about 1999. So what he does, he leaves this construction to the level of homology uh, in the following sense. Uh, instead of assigning a polynomial to a link, and what is a polynomial? Essentially, it's a bunch of coefficients, a uh, bunch of uh, integer numbers. He uh, assigns uh, to any link a complex uh, of graded R modules. So it's it's essentially a bi-graded R module. It's a, so he works over an arbitrary ring R and he has essentially um, a differential complex of, uh, of graded R modules, which uh, he shows is defined up to quasi-isomorphisms. So he shows that his definition up to quasi-isomorphisms is, is, is invariant under all three itemized removes. Know that out uh, of this construction, you immediately get a bunch of cohomology groups, uh, which are again bi-graded, uh, and therefore a bunch of numbers, which are dimensions of these cohomology groups. Uh, and essentially, the way he defines his complex uh, is oh, he, the way he defines the complex he assigns to each link is almost identical to the to the way Jones proceeds. He uh, imposes a scheme relation that uh, the uh, complex you assign uh, to a uh, link with a crossing somewhere is a complex you assign. Now, here is um, the, the subtlety. Uh, you take a complex you assign to a link uh, with uh, sort of uh, replacement of this over crossing uh, by these two, uh, uh, vertical strands. And then you take a complex you assign to the uh, link uh, where you replay, where you resolve the crossing by this to by cap and cap. And you shift the internal grading. So not the grading in the complex. Uh, the grading in the complex no, node will be shifted automatically because I'm about to take call, which will shift this whole thing in. in by degree one to the left compared to this. But I also want to shift the internal grading, this grading uh, by one to the left as well. So uh, both gradings in this uh, complex will be shifted compared to, to, to what they should be. And then uh, the subtlety is that the Hohenov defines uh, his assignment in such a way that there is a natural morphism which exists between uh, two complexes uh, uh, which differ only by replacing cap and cap uh, by uh, this uh, two vertical strands. And what he does is he applies a straight cone construction of this to, uh, of, of this morph of, the, of this natural morphism. Uh, what he gets is something uh, that he calls homological skin relation. Uh, note that, uh, of course, uh, when you project, when you do this sort of the usual thing and you project to, uh, to, uh, so when, when you then project to cohomology groups, uh, you essentially uh, obtain uh, precisely this relation, uh, except uh, that the multiplying by Q uh, will correspond uh, to this grading shift. And indeed, uh, we can recover John's polynomial as the Euler characteristic uh, of, the, of this complex that we assigned to, uh, to the link. So, this Euler characteristic uh, is going to be uh, alternating sum uh, minus one to the power of i, where i is uh, the degree in the complex. And then uh, the uh, dimension of the ij cohomology group multiplied by q to the power of j, where j is the internal grading. So uh, therefore, if you will, if you will sort of project all these formulas down to here, then this, then this relation will become uh, exactly this. 
Uh, and uh, what you will get is actually Q times Q plus Q minus one times the Jones polynomial, uh, which is precisely this uh, scale Kaufman bracket here. Uh, and now the final bit of the introduction where we really get into what we are interested in uh, is going to be uh, the categorification of tangle calculus by countess Kamnitzer. Before I proceed, are there any questions about, uh, about this part, uh, about the whole of homology? And what does this morphism exist? And what is it's natural? Uh, well, in a, in a sense, uh, I think this will be clear where does this morphism come from will be clear when I will sort of, when I'll talk about this story. I mean, essentially uh, here you do uh, naturally something that Hovnov, I mean, Hovnov ensures the existence of this morphism by hand. He, uh, he just defines uh, his uh, basic assignments in such a way that this morphism is always there. I mean, he uh, basically, the way he does it, he talks about, uh, if you have any link, then he considers all the crossings and then he builds uh, essentially a whole cube uh, where you notice that each of the, any crossing like this can be resolved one of two ways. And uh, he builds a cube of complexes uh, where each uh, vertex of the cube is, you know, you choose one of the resolutions. When you resolve all the crossings by either this or this, you will get in each case some uh, composition of unknots. And the thing that he assigns to unknot uh, them and the way he uh, does the disjoint union ensures uh, that uh, he also, along with all these complexes at, the, at each edge of the cube, he also gets a morphism between those complexes corresponding to, oh, sorry, at the vertex of the cube. He gets the morphism between those complexes at the edge of the cube. And then he just takes the total uh, complex uh, of this cube. It's, uh, so he, 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 he doesn't actually proceed as inductively as here. He sort of resolves in a sense the whole uh, link uh, at once in every possible way. And then out of the complex assigned to each of them, uh, he obtains uh, the, to the total thing. Again, uh, I, if I start going into the details of how this morphism is defined, uh, I wouldn't get to any of uh, stuff that we did. So uh, let me just uh, okay. say, uh, in, in a moment, I will show where conceptually, where does this morphism come from? I'm sorry, may I ask a question also? Yeah. Uh, sure, so, sure. so I'm not asking for the precise definition of C of L, but uh, is there some kind of uniqueness theorem? So is it just some construction, a construction or there no, many, no, no, no. It is as, as far as I know. This is only a construction. This, uh -huh. this is well, well, you know, uh, we say that it's a construction, but uh, notice that uh, at least in this case, it's quite clear that anything that obeys a scheme relation only depends on what you assign to unknot. Uh -huh. So I think that once you, uh, I mean, here it's a bit uh, trickier because you have to uh, ensure that you have this morphism here. Uh, so, but again, uh, the moral of this story is once you, is, is essentially, uh, it's once you impose the skin relation, uh, it's sort of completely follow your nose story. So, um, uh, but as, as always, uh, as I, say, as, as I said, uh, here it's sort of completely unique uh, once you take this generation. Here uh, uh, it's not unique and I don't think anything is said in the original paper about uniqueness. But morally it should be unique uh, up, up, to, uh, up to something. So let, uh, as I said, uh, I will also would like to postpone this until I will sort of really explain what this what the skin relation is. Okay, maybe I'm sorry. One more question. So, yeah. in, in your formula, you you have the uh, factor minus one to the i, mm -hmm. and uh, so if one replaces it with t to the i, so one gets a polynomial in two variables. Yes. So, is it possible to define it uh, without this uh, uh, c? So I mean, just, uh, just for least. Uh, 
interesting, but uh, the question is, um, uh, I mean, the question is, would this uh, be, uh, no, I, uh, I don't know. In, in that case, you are really considering uh, uh, you're really considering, uh, so, so basically you want to work with this, uh, uh, you really want to consider the bigrading uh, each um, uh, index here separately. Uh, I don't know if there is, uh, if there is a good way to define this polynomial without, uh, the, without this construction. Uh, just what I'm saying is not without this construction, but to uh, instead consider polynomial. Ah, oh, oh, you mean for two variables without construction? Yeah, 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 yeah. So where, whether you can do something like this? I see, I see, I see. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, a more, in a sense, a more conceptual, and in to my mind, uh, to my mind, I mean, the reason I did not want to answer the questions about the integrity of this construction is because I think this construction is explained a lot better uh, by a rather beautiful work of seven colleges and Joe Cummins in 2007, because there is a lot of ad hoc sort of things here, uh, while there is very little ad hoc here. So they compute Hovenov homology of any link. And this is where we're getting into genuine geometrical representation theory. And I feel that uh, some members of the audience will know a lot more about uh, this stuff than I do. Uh, so they do it by constructing an auction of tangle calculus on the derived category of not the, I mean, um, right. So uh, let me, so as usual, uh, it's, a lot easier to explain. So what I'm saying here is that uh, they have an action of tangle calculus on derived categories of slices, uh, I will explain which, of the cotangent bundle to uh, a certain partial flag uh, in a rather large dimensional uh, complex space. Uh, so as I said, example explains this a lot better than uh, anything else. So what the recipe that they do is they take, you take uh, your planar diagram of your uh, tangle and you slice it up. You slice it up into tiny slices so, so that at each level uh, you essentially have one basic generator. I mean, here I sort of cheat a little bit because I really should have moved uh, this crossing and this cup uh, to two different vertical levels. So I, sh I really should have had a line here. But since they happen on entirely uh, separate uh, sort of parts of the diagram, they commute. So I sort of, I do them in one go. But uh, really it should be just so that each uh, level has either cup, a cap or a cup or one of the crossings. Uh, then uh, at each level, you will have some bunch of endpoints. So this level passes through no endpoints. This passes through two, has two intersection points with the, with the tangle, four intersection points, four intersection points, one intersection point. Then you choose some very large number N. This N must be larger uh, than uh, any number of endpoints on any level, uh, a lot larger. And then to, every uh, num to any number of endpoints, you attach the following derived category. You attach, uh, you take a cotangent bundle to uh, the flag, uh, the partial flag in this two n dimensional space containing uh, the first uh, number of dimensions uh, which corresponds to number of endpoints here. So we'll, we'll always sit in the same uh, huge dimensional complex space. We take different lengths of, uh, of flux. The result actually doesn't depend on n as long as n is sufficiently larger than all of that. Uh, and then we take n, n slot of a slice. And here I'm getting sort of, uh, I really want to brush a lot of things under the carpet. So n, n corresponds to n, n Jordan block. Uh, as we know, uh, 
cotangent bundle to a flock variety can be described uh, as a flock plus an endomorphism of your two dimensional of your complex space alpha, which maps each element of the flock to the next one down the line. So, you know, the alpha here, we must have this flock and the, cotang the direction in the cotangent bundle is endomorphism alpha, which maps the whole space into V4, V4 into V3, V3 into V2, V2 into V1. So it's a nil potent uh, endomorphism. And I, and by saying NN slowly slice, I dictate that it must have uh, Jordan uh, type NN. So I'm basically, I'm taking this uh, cotangent bundle, this flux space and taking sort of a small slice of it by uh, restricting the cotangent directions I'm working with. And then slow to be slice actually means a certain resolution of what you get. Uh, so this is not strictly speaking within the subspace of this flux space, but but as I said, up to some uh, uh, harmless manipulations uh, like resolution of singularities. This is uh, the moral of it is that we take this big thing and we take a small slice inside it, and then we do the following. Uh, there is a geometrical construction, which I will describe later in a lot more generality. So uh, for the moment, let me sort of just say that uh, there is a way to assign to any cup uh, a functor uh, between the corresponding direct categories. So that's, uh, it's, a, it's a rather beautiful construction. We'll, in, in four slides, uh, you will see it in, in sort of in full go some details, detail. So uh, then to a cap, I say, I assign the right adjoint of a cup. And what I assign to a crossing is a cone of uh, the adjunction co-unit for the adjunction between uh, the cup uh, functor and cap functor. So what I get uh, is, a, uh, what I will get is a functor assigned to the crossing. Now, any functor assigned to a crossing has to be invertible because it's uh, very easy, you know, the, if this is an overcrossing, I can write an undercrossing, which will have to compose with this to identity. So essentially, and uh, the functors for which uh, this guy is called usually a spherical twist of a uh, cone of a junction co unit, a spherical twist of a cup functor. And uh, by assigning uh, uh, this to something that has to be invertible, I'm essentially saying that my cup functor is spherical. And, and indeed it is. So uh, this proceed, so as long, no, notice that then, since this is not equivalence, I can assign to undercrossing just the inverse of this functor, which actually, uh, if you study spherical functors, uh, you will see that it can be, uh, the, the inverse of this is the cone of, uh, a junction unit uh, for the left adjoint um, of this functor. My memory doesn't kill me. So, uh, but the moral of it is that as long as you know what to assign to a cap functor, the cap functor is its right adjoint and the crossing is dictated by uh, this original skin relation. And then you simply take your slicing of the original tangle and at every level you uh, obtain you assign a functor uh, between these categories which corresponds to one of these uh, four things cap cap over crossing under crossing so for example here uh, uh, I would break up the functor assigned to this link as a composition of these functors we always go from bottom to top and the functor assigned to two disjoint bits uh, is usually just uh, uh, the, the, the uh, composition in any uh, order of the functors are assigned to each of these individual guys, since they act uh, on uh, two different parts of the construction, it turns out that the functors commute, which are assigned to them. So, and the, so uh, this is why it's, it's a sort of, it's, it's, it's a categorification of tangle calculus. I'm essentially saying that if I have any tangle, any planar projection of a link, then I can assign a functor uh, to it uh, from, uh, from direct category vector space to direct category vector spaces, which uh, obeys all the relations that cups, caps, and this overcrossing and undercrossings uh, must obey. So what I get at the end of it is a functor from sort of uh, 
the category assigned to uh, empty level line, which is just derived category of empty flux, so derived category of a point, uh, derived category of vector spaces, to derived category of vector spaces. What's the functor from derived category of vector space to derived category of vector spaces? This is determined completely by uh, the image of one dimensional vector space sitting at the degree zero. So it's just some object in direct category of vector spaces. And that's just some complex uh, of uh, vector spaces up to uh, quasi isomorphism. And uh, it turns out that uh, if you take its homologies, then you will, then you will recover precisely Hoban of homology. If you take this uh, complex uh, of vector spaces, which is the image of just, if your vector spaces over C, then you take the image of C, you get the complex of vector spaces, compute uh, its um, uh, cohomology groups like this. I mean, you always, uh, and uh, you will obtain the uh, Hovind of homology if you sort of fudge the grading like this. Uh, if my memory serves me, the second grading comes uh, from sort of from considering that uh, everything is a sister action. So uh, now the, of course, this second grading is, uh, you know, you can do this, this whole thing. If you're not interested in Hovna homology, you can do this whole thing without a sister action. You, you still obtain the action of uh, Tango calculus on, uh, on plain, uh, cotangent bundle stools to two flux spaces. So an interesting fact that sort of 10 years ago set me and Rina on a long sort of journey of understanding. The Tango calculus does not act on whole uh, cotangent, or on this whole sort of spaces cotangent bundle to corresponding uh, partial flat right. So taking this, and then Jordan block inside here is crucial. Uh, the uh, relations that must hold between cup cap and two crossings do not hold in here. They only hold when you restrict them to this small uh, part uh, of this story. So the tangle calculus doesn't act in this whole spaces. And by studying what was happening, we were led to realize that there is a more complicated structure acting on uh, the sort of whole cotangent bundles to flux uh, varieties. Uh, Cotangent bundles to partial flat varieties, which simplifies the tangle calculus on, uh, on these uh, and then slowly slices. So, the question is what is this structure? Uh, are there any questions about uh, this part of the story? So, to uh, answer both previous questions, uh, essentially, uh, the uh, if you sort of uh, looked at from this point of view, here the uh, natural morphism in the skin relation is completely obvious. It's just uh, the uh, uh, the cup and a cap are a pair of adjoint uh, functors, and uh, there is a if you compose them, there is natural functor into identity. What sort of happens here is uh, doing the same thing by hand uh, on a, uh, when sort of uh, projected uh, from uh, the category of direct vector spaces to just the, co to just the co homology of, of complexes. So now the answer is, so I've explained hopefully, uh, what a skin relation is. I haven't explained what skin translated is, we'll get there. But now I, will, I come to the explaining what generalized braids are, because we claim that what acts uh, on these uh, uh, space, on these cotangent bundles, the flood varieties uh, is uh, a structure called generalized braid category. Uh, just testing, uh, is, is Zoom working fine? Can you still hear me and, and then see me? Yes, we do. At least my talk, excellent. So uh, now this is the sort of awkward part of this talk because uh, when I gave uh, first few talks about this, I tried to sweep this under the carpet and I realized that the result is a very unsatisfying talk. I tell you, we came up with this amazing uh, new structure which explains uh, the sort of the uh, 
certain things occurring in the geometry of cotangent models to flat varieties, but then I don't tell you what the structure is. Uh, so now I just realized I have to bite the bullet and give this definition. So please uh, uh, bear with me because this is sort of long and technical, but as before, I prefer to, um, uh, rather than trying to understand the abstract definition here, it might be good to just look at the sort of the picture here once I come to, uh, to sort of explaining it. So the idea is that what is the usual braid group? A usual braid group means we have a configuration of N strings and we consider uh, sort of topological configurations formed by uh, sort of N strings stretched from N separate endpoints to n separate endpoints, the strings are not allowed to touch and they're not allowed to double back. So this is not a tangle calculus. We don't have cups and caps. We only have crossings. The sort of the uh, orientation of the string always goes positively um, uh, as we proceed from the uh, start point to the end point of the string. So uh, essentially, so, Generalized braids, roughly, are braids where strands are allowed to touch. So uh, we allow the strands to come together. This means that when talking about uh, the sort of start points and end points of this configuration, of, of this configuration, for example, here is an example of a generalized braid. You sort of start with uh, a multiplicity five uh, strand, you know, five strands stuck together. And the one strand, uh, then uh, the five strands are split into a two strand and a three strand, uh, and one strand sort of crosses under the two strand. So it's quite clear that uh, if you allow to, uh, if you allow your um, braids to come together, then two things happen. Firstly, you no longer uh, have a monoid live alone a group, because you no longer have a single configuration of n separate endpoints, uh, which is uh, which uh, your your uh, braid is a sort of uh, endomorphism of. Instead, uh, you must consider every possible uh, ordered partition uh, uh, of m. So if I have n strands, then, the, then uh, you know, they can be stuck together in any uh, way that forms an ordered partition of m. So my objects in this category uh, are uh, ordered partitions of m, a bunch of numbers which all add to m. And I think of them as, for example, uh, you know, so this is a more, so, so this is an object in my category, which is one five. This is an object in my category, which is two, one, three. Morphisms, as I said, intuitively are uh, these braids where strands are allowed to touch. However, we, we only allow them to touch in a very controlled way. Uh, and we do not want to give here a sort of a topological definition because uh, trying to, in, in sort of in, in a general topological sense, explain how we are allowed the strands to touch would be horrid. Effectively, uh, when the strands come together, we do not allow them to braid, we, we do not allow them sort of to, to, to uh, twist. In a sense, rather than strands, we have ribbons. So if you think here, we have a sort of a ribbon of uh, tie of, of width two coming together with a ribbon of width three, to, or, or rather, sorry, a ribbon of with five splitting into ribbon of width two and a ribbon of width three. And this is important because something that's not a part of this definition, because this is the part of the story which we haven't worked out yet. Uh, there should also be uh, an operation which is called a ribbon twist. There should be morphism from say, uh, uh, um, three, uh, three points stuck together to three points stuck together, which corresponds to sort of the three strands going uh, and then the whole ribbon's getting twisted, the whole ribbon getting twisted. Why uh, sort of am I saying this? Because we are not uh, defining this out of thin air. This definition comes of studying the relations uh, which exist between uh, certain functors between derived categories of cotangent bundles to flat varieties. 
So when we say we don't want to track what happens inside uh, the uh, the uh, uh, multiplicity n strand, because we see on the uh, uh, in the geometry that it doesn't matter. So in order to have a precise definition, therefore, we do not, instead of talking about this uh, sort of uh, strands uh, coming together, touching, uh, splitting apart, we talk about uh, a oriented trivalent graph equipped with, an, with some uh, information. Firstly, every edge of the graph is colored uh, by a number from one to M, which is what we call strand multiplicity. And the, this uh, coloring must satisfy the flow condition. You know, either you have peak, uh, two in one out, in which case mm, total, well, basically the flow condition is the total sum of uh, inflowing uh, edges should be equal to the uh, total sum of uh, multiplicities of outflowing edges. Plus, uh, in addition to most of the graph, which is three, three valent, we have a collection of one valent start point vertices and the colorings uh, on all of them should add to M and a bunch of one valent endpoint vertices. And again, uh, the colorings of all of them must add to M. So in this sense, this, uh, braid would correspond to this three, three valent graph with a bunch of uh, start points and end points and this coloring. And then once we have this graph, we consider it together with an embedding into uh, R2 tensor zero one. So it's a three space, uh, which we consider between the level zero and level one. All start points exist on level zero, all end points exist on level one, and this is a braid. So orientation projects positively onto the vertical interval from zero to one. So the, uh, all, the, uh, all the sort of edges uh, must always go uh, upwards um, in the direction of their orientation. And again, uh, something that is not uh, formally written down as a part of this definition, but I will sort of, on the next page already, you will, you will see clearly what I, what I mean when I talk about uh, ribbon twist. We consider these edges actually existing on, on the ribbons. So it's not, we consider it not, not as embedding of these edges, but actually as embedding of this edge with sort of a, with a neighborhood around it. And uh, we, uh, and therefore, what can happen is that we can we can have an embedding where this whole sort of ribbon on which this uh, edge exists twists over potentially several times. Uh, but I'm sorry, uh, my question. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. why why do you need R squared? So uh, as far as I can see, you always embed it into R tensor z times zero one. Uh, well, no, because uh, then I'd have to talk. Uh, I mean, this is the same old story. I mean, I have an undercrossing and overcrossing. Oh, I see. I see. I see. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Am I, uh, so, am I uh, wrong or? Yeah. No, no sorry. Please finish your. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to say that uh, what I draw here, as usual, are planar projections of this embedding. I mean, if you look, a definition of a classical braid will run in exactly the same way, only you have sort of start points at level zero, end points at level one in R3, and orientation projects positively onto zero to one. And now I can, I don't have to talk about trivalent graphs or any of this nonsense. I can talk about just uh, M strands, uh, uh, which don't touch anywhere and uh, satisfy these conditions. So classical braids uh, just uh, disallow, uh, you, you know, remove the trivalent graph. Just okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the, the diagrams we talk about are as usual planar projections of this, uh, this three-dimensional topological objects. And there are as usual Rydermeister modes which correspond to the projections which we don't allow, meaning, and the projections we don't allow are the ones where triple crossings, cusps or caps, Happen. This is the sort of the usual uh, uh, something very familiar uh, in this business. So the generalized braids are considered up to isotopies of this embedded ribbon graphs. So uh, and 
another thing, something we call multi-fork and multi-merge relations. I'll describe them. So isotopies of embedded graphs, meaning I, I, this is how, you know, this would be very, so this is the reason for the graph language. It would be very difficult for me to sort of say that I'm, I'm, I can consider continuous transformations of these strands, but I must not allow, I mean, the really early, say seven years ago versions of this talk, I would talk about uh, sort of the isotopies which are not allowed to sort of take uh, a strand which merges and then splits and sort of zip it up, meaning just remove this uh, merge split thing. Just uh, so imagine this multiplicity five splitting into two, three, and then merging back together in five. I can do an isotopy which just sort of removes this splitting and that merge, and you're just left with a single vertical multiplicity five uh, strand. This is clearly something I must not allow. Uh, when I say isotopy of embedded graphs, I mean I take care of this automatically because every merge is in this and every split is a vertex in a graph, and I of course am not allowed to sort of do sort of just collapse to merge into each other. So this is actually a very neat uh, way of of saying exactly which isotopies of our uh, braids uh, we allow. And multi-fork and multi-merge just says that if you've got a P plus Q plus R multiplicity strand, where you first split off a P strand and then split off a Q strand, that's the same thing as first splitting off an R strand and then splitting off a Q strand. What this means is that if you take a thick strand and split it off into a bunch of uh, uh, smaller multiplicity strands, it completely doesn't matter which order they do it. All that matters is the final configuration here. You know, this, this means that this braid is completely determined by uh, the, uh, there's only one fork, uh, basically, there's only one fork uh, braid which forks a thick strand into any uh, sort of um, endpoint configuration here. So composition of these things is given by concatenation and scaling. Scaling just uh, because we, we ask for start points and end points to exist at level zero and level one. If I just concatenate two such things, I will have them on level zero and two. And scaling just means uh, scale the vertical interval zero, two back to zero, one. And identity of, is of course just a bunch of parallel vertical strands with sort of no graph in between. So just one valence start points and endpoint vertices. Are there any questions about this? Uh, this will all become a lot clearer as I will, start, as I will sort of give some, some examples right now, but before I proceed, uh, uh, so uh, before I proceed, are there any uh, questions? And also please tell me uh, uh, how much time do I have? Is it sort of, is it an hour talk and I'm already? Uh, no, no, it's uh, we usually, two hours. We usually have something like one and a half, but. Uh, well, well, this is very good. If people do have patience. Okay, I, have a, I, have uh, I mean, the, 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 uh, after I gave this definition, I can sort of finish this story at any uh, uh, point. So uh, actually, I as far as I can see, you have eight slides, right? Uh, I don't think we'll, uh, well, but some of, I mean, just running a bit ahead, some of the slides look like they, oh, my apologies. <laughs> uh, just a second. Let's see if I can get to the slides, which are, uh, yes, so some of the slides have very large pictures. So in principle, so I mean, it's of course up to you, but this all looks very interesting. So if you want, you can uh, continue. Uh, 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 some, let some me of the try next to, uh, let, I've given this talk successfully in an hour and a half. So let me try to give it in an hour and a half and maybe sort of overrun by uh, 10 minutes or so. Sure. Because I have a question. Yes. Uh, so, uh, will you do you plan to, or is it is it part of the story to to define this kind of uh, category by basically generators and relations? Yes, 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 yes. Trust me. Uh, I'm about if 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 this is exactly. Uh, I mean, this is where scheme triangulated comes in. Uh, I can tell. I can ask you a question like this. The big thing we're talking, I talk about in this uh, talk, which is scan, uh, the higher analogs of scan relations are essentially the triangulated category relations, which allow you to define the action of this whole category by just defining actions of forks because uh, merges are just right adjoints of forks. 
and crossings are defined using the skein relations from merges and forks. Just like in Tangle Calculus story, the crossings were defined using the skein relation from cups and caps. So this whole talk is about how to do this all on generators. Did I answer your question? Well, at least, did I, did I successfully promise to answer your question in the moment? Sorry, Sergey, are you still around? Yeah, yeah, we, we just oh, locked yeah. this out. Uh, so yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah good, good. So, sorry, uh, uh, Zoom, some, Zoom sometimes hangs up on me. So I ask this uh, question, whether you my best can still hear me to make sure the Zoom hasn't frozen up again. Right, so let me give a simple example. What is generalized braid category on two strings? Well, if you've got, if N is two, then you just have two possible start point and end point configurations. Two, two strings stuck together or two strings uh, uh, pulled apart. And uh, there exists only one fork. Uh, uh, so my notation uh, for forks and merges will always be, if I have a single fork, then it's completely described because of the multi-fork and multi-merge is completely described uh, by specifying the, end, the start point configuration and end point configuration. For example, from two to one, one, there goes only one possible fork. From one, one to two goes only one possible merge. This will be also true, for example, uh, if this is three and this is one, 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 or if this is three and this is one, two. So in this case, we just have this one fork, this one merge, and we have two crossings. So the thing with crossings is, as we'll see in a moment, even uh, I'm sort of cheating a bit because crossings could not be described by just start point and end point of generation. When you have M, uh, Sort of uh, already in three in in case n equals three you will have t one 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 t one 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 and then uh, you you could have either this crossing and the line here or this crossing and the line here so with crossings it's a bit subtler but forks and merges are completely uh, described by essentially two numbers um, so these guys completely generate all morphisms morphisms are just sort of combinations of these and some parallel uh, strands. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, sorry, there wouldn't be even parallel strands, it's just words on these guys. And oh, except that there are relations, of course. There is, uh, for example, uh, the two crossings are inverse to each other. So, uh, a question which people usually ask at this stage, and the one that Sergey probably uh, tried uh, to ask, is uh, what are in a sense, generalized braid relations. Because we know that for classical braid group, when you don't have the forks or merges, uh, the uh, relations are, are just uh, overcrossing is the inverse of undercrossing and the braid relation. Uh, ti, ti plus one, ti is ti plus uh, one, ti, ti plus one. The answer is there is a list of relations uh, which uh, called generalized braid relations that must exist between all forks, uh, merge and crossings. Uh, and this list is quite horrible. And this is not the sort of the way we, we want to proceed. But just for the record, uh, what is then a weak categorical representation of generalized braid category? So when we had a braid group, we just assigned to every possible braid a functor from a dear and, and the functor of a derived category. So now, uh, which, and this derived category sort of corresponded to the single endpoint configuration and uh, strings uh, pulled apart. So now we have um, to every partition of N, we assign a category. To any braid, to any morphism between these guys, we assign a functor. And this functor has to respect the composition. So the functor we assign to a composition of two braids have to be the composition of functors we assign to each braid individually. There is an F missing here. Uh, so another way to think of this, since all the morphisms in the uh, generalized braid category are generalized by forks, merges, and crossings, uh, so this is, again, I'm fudging here because uh, with crossing factors, I have to specify uh, which uh, I, I, 
along with the start point configuration and end point configuration also have to specify uh, which uh, strands cross over. So for example, I have, uh, well, we'll, we'll get there in a moment. Uh, but once you write all forks, all merges, no crossings, all uh, morphisms come from there. So if you write out relations uh, which exist between them, uh, you can then uh, consider weak categorical representations to be just a collection of fork, merge, and crossing functors which satisfy generalized braid relations. Uh, this is uh, an awful way of doing this because this list of generalized braid relations is not what you actually want to sort of to be dealing with. So notice that uh, in sort of, um, uh, we want to use a different uh, sort of way of constructing uh, representation of this category. So question, when the category, suppose we want to represent uh, our uh, generalized braid category on a uh, bunch of triangulated categories. So our question is, what are the analogs of skein relation? Essentially, if you remember, even going back to Cautis and sort of Kamnitzer uh, calculus, the skein relation, uh, you know, they had a cap fun functor, then the cap was its adjoint, and the crossing was obtained using the cone as a spherical twist, uh, using the cone construction on the uh, adjunction uh, co-unit of cap and cap. So the whole, uh, representation of, uh, was governed completely uh, sort of was essentially uniquely defined by what uh, cup factor uh, cup functor did so uh, we have a lot more complicated situation because we have a lot uh, you know the merge functors will always be just uh, the adjoints of the fork functors but uh, we have a lot more complicated crossings. So uh, if, so notice that in this case, everything is still, all you need in, for GBR2 is still uh, to define a representation, is still just a skein relation. Just that saying that this is, uh, will be a cone of a junction co-unit uh, and this will be its inverse. Uh, but what happens when you have more complicated crossings? So answering the question of what are, uh, these analogs of skein relation, how to define crossings out of forks and merges. And not just that, as, you, as we will see, uh, we will impose not just relations which tell you how to get crossings out of forks and merges, but as it turns out, there are extra relations which don't, which don't define anything, but ensure that what you get will actually satisfy this generalized braid relations. So we expect the analogs of skein relations to be a set of conditions or relation which is sufficient to generate the whole representation of generalized braid group from, this, from just the set of four factors. So we call representations of generalized braid categories satisfying this relation skein triangulated because uh, these, are, uh, these are sort of skein relations in triangulated uh, uh, category context. So at present, we don't have a fully general definition. We do have uh, a pretty good conjecture though uh, of what this definition is. We have the definitions for n equals two and n equals three, and I'll give them on the next uh, couple of pages. We also have two examples of skein triangulated representations of GBRN for arbitrary n. One I mentioned already, this is the motivating example that we kind of came up with this whole theory by study, which is the auction of the relation between certain uh, very natural geometrical sort of uh, geometrically defined functors on cotangent bundles to flat varieties. Uh, the second one is something we call a categorical Neil Hecke algebra. And I will uh, sort of, we came up with it uh, by sort of answering a question uh, uh, of what, uh, happens if, you, if you've got a bunch of braiding or the equivalences uh, uh, on a given category. But now we actually have two families of uh, examples for arbitrary M and by studying these families and computing uh, the relations which exist between four functors in those contexts, in those two families of examples, we hope to extrapolate the general definition. 
So now let me uh, tell you what we have for n equals two and n equals three. But before I do that, are there any questions? Cool. So th 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 as I said, this will go uh, a lot faster than the first slide because uh, you're here and I'm, I'm uh, not trying to abbreviate a lot of uh, a lot of uh, existing and very uh, clever work by people far cleverer than I am. So here's the definition: a categorical representation of GBR two is skein triangulated if the following four conditions hold. Firstly, uh, C two the two categories which uh, GBR two acts on have to be enhanced triangulated categories. I mean. Uh, we prefer DG enhancements, but any higher categorical enhancements that allow you to take cones of functors will do you. Uh, the, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, could you please uh, uh, go to the previous slide for, for me? Sure, sure, happily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by the way, uh, I don't know, is it possible for you to put the file uh, to the chat so we, we can uh, sure. look? Uh, how would you like me to do it? So let I'm, me see. Uh, uh, just a moment. Let, let me see if I can manage it. Uh, mm -hmm. All right. So this is interesting. So in, in principle, there is an option of putting a file into the chat. So yeah, I know. So at the moment, I'm seeing if Zoom is clever enough. Meaning, if can I just tell it to uh, open? There should be an option open an application. Mm -hmm. It can do it to Telegram. Can it do it to Zoom? Uh, yes, it can do it to Zoom. Mm -hmm. Very good. So, uh, yeah, yeah, record it. Sure, uh, share to ongoing meeting. Is this going to work? I think you're just sharing your screen and not the. Uh, file. I see. Maybe, maybe it sort of it doesn't uh, allow for that. Um, yeah, I don't think this quite worked. Uh, can I email this to somebody and they can put it in a chat? Because I think that while sharing the screen, I would sure. be able to do this. Uh, yeah, sure. So, so uh, let, let, me, let me email it to the same email uh, that I've sent the title abstract to. Sorry, just a moment. It's for... Zhenya Makedonsky, yes, or? Yes, uh, it's, it's uh, I sent it, I sent uh, to the both, You sent it to both of us, either Let's one see. will do. Notes to both of you, notes. Uh, yeah, and let me uh, give, attach this, yep. It's 30 megabytes, I hope, uh, uh, but it will probably ask me, yeah, it, you will get uh, a link. Cool. Oh, just sent an email. Uh, please, okay. please do this. Uh, I don't think I got it. Maybe you shouldn't got it. Excellent. So, what was the question? Meanwhile, no, I haven't got it. Neither, neither have I. You have no. not. No. Well, I, I wait a second. Oh yes, I got it. I, it's... Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to look at the definition of uh, GBR2. Yeah, yeah, here. I see here. In, in this example, I see it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. So GBR2 has two objects and four generating morphisms. Uh huh, uh huh. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So now I'm saying that uh, yes, good. Um, that uh, the two categories which correspond to two objects have to be enhanced triangulated categories. The only uh, mer the merge has to be the left adjoint of the fork. And uh, now the crossing, the only sort of uh, the overcrossing, has to be the cone of the adjunction unit from identity into the uh, composition of uh, F of the fork uh, and the merge. So if I write it graphically, it looks like this. Uh, this uh, guy here is the merge, which is the left adjoint of the fork. This is the fork. And I'm taking a unit, uh, uh, a junction unit from the identity into it. 
And this is the very, you know, this is exactly the very familiar scheme relation we've seen a number of times. You get the uh, uh, crossing by taking a cone uh, from, uh, I mean, in classical context, it was sort of uh, two vertical strands in cup and cap, but you cup and cap in our world turn into this uh, composition of fork and merge. Timothy, can can you uh, also comment about the inverse? I mean, the, about the other crossing. Uh, so, are, are the yeah. are the, uh, yeah. the, the fork and the the uh, the uh, the merge bio joints? Uh, no, they are not. Uh, the uh, the story is that um, was spherical. Uh, the story is that, of course, uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, well, in a moment. So. Uh, the, set, the, the fourth condition will tell you that, in fact, your fork functor is spherical. Because uh, the fork functor, uh, so, so. And then uh, the other crossing, you know, if you have a spherical functor, then, you'll, then it also has a left eye joint. And uh, uh, the left, if you take now the, the cone of that junction core unit of the, so, uh, sorry, uh, if it's spherical, there's also a right eye joint. I mean, I'm, uh, and uh, if I take the cone of the junction core unit from composition of the fork functor with its right eye joint into uh, into identity, then that will give me the inverse of this. This is the sort of standard voodoo of spherical functors. But um, uh, so, but for our purposes, we can, having defined uh, the overcrossing, we can define undercrossing just to be its inverse. So uh, now, the interesting part of, uh, part of this is that, uh, so this is quite sort of obvious in general break category, but then we have this slightly mysterious thing that if you take a junction of co-unit, you also get an auto-equivalence. But now you get an auto-equivalence not of this category, but of the category uh, which you uh, represent two points stuck together. What and what kind of what equivalence can you have there? Remember I said about ribbon twists. This is exactly what it is. If you think of this as a sort of as a width to ribbon, then what am I allowed to do in my sort of uh, in my original uh, world? Uh, because I consider embedded ribbon graphs. I'm allowed to take a twist of this, uh, of this ribbon. And this is what this non-trivial of equivalence going from sort of from two points stuck together to two points stuck together is. As I said, we are, this is uh, really new. We understood that this ribbon twist, I mean, Rina sort of refused to believe in this, uh, that this is really a ribbon twist because certain relations had to be, had to hold. I've computed and sh uh, have shown to her that these relations do hold for flux. Uh, so we are now uh, sort of convinced of this, but uh, before writing this down, we want to um, sort of to make sure that what we write down is, uh, uh, sort of makes sense. So for the moment, I'm just sort of uh, telling you this part of the story verbally. But these are all, the, these are the only relations there are. The skein relation, the standard, you know, the uh, more, uh, fork is adjoint, uh, merge is adjoint of the fork, and this uh, weird sort of second relation, which produces uh, the, uh, the ribbon twist. Now, here is a proposition which actually uh, appeared in our paper spherical functors. If you have any functor between two uh, enhanced triangulated categories, such that uh, these two relations hold, the call, the adjunction, uh, the cone of the adjunction unit and the cone of adjunction co-unit of this functor is an auto equivalence, then uh, defining uh, the left adjoint uh, as in here, and defining the crossing uh, to be this uh, cone of the adjunction unit will give you a scheme triangulate represent representation of uh, GBR2. So, uh, so what I'm saying is that if you've got a fork functor such that it satisfies sort of these conditions, and uh, then no more, then uh, you automatically get a representation of GBR2, the so-called generalized braid relations, uh, 
which are in this case are sort of very simple, they are actually sort of whole. It also tells us that what, in a sense, we've been telling you is not uh, uh, some sort of completely abstract nonsense, because what this proposition tells you, the scheme to relate representations and generate great category of two strings are simply spherical functions. If you've got a functor uh, for which has a left and right argument and for which these two conditions hold, uh, then uh, this function is spherical and uh, the, all the sort of other relations you want to hold here hold as well. So, uh, if uh, this is you know, circle functors are sort of well known and well used. Uh, so if you've been sort of unconvinced by us saying the generalized braid category governs this uh, geometry of potential modes of flood varieties, then you know this uh, outtake on it might sort of interest you that in some sense, skin triangulate representation of GBRM is this sort of higher analog of spherical functors that you know people have talked about, sort of flock functors in a sense, but you, you, one, one function is no longer enough. So uh, are there any questions about this? Because I'm just about to proceed to a definition of categorical representation of GPR3. Cool. So categorical representation of generalized break group on three strands is skin triangulated if. Uh, so, I mean, you still have uh, four categories corresponding to three strands stuck together, uh, two and one, two strand and one strand, one strand and two strand, and all three strands pulled apart. So as usual, all these guys have to be enhanced and related categories. And then something that always is the case, we have two natural embeddings of generalized bright category and two strings uh, into generalized bright category and three strings. These embeddings are called take a generalized braid on two strings and draw a vertical string on the right of it, and take a generalized braid on three on two strings and draw uh, a string on the left of it. And uh, my first condition is that uh, these two embeddings must give skin triangulator representations of GBR2, which we know what they are. I mean, I have some action of GBR3 on a bunch of categories. If I now uh, consider them as uh, actions of GBR2 on these categories, they will be skin triangulated. In effect, this means that, uh, so what I'm telling you in particular, that uh, a fork functor with a string to the right of it and a fork functor with a string to the left of it, in other words, the fork functor which takes us from C21 to C11 and C12 to C11. So here we have uh, a fork functor forking two strand into two one strands and a one parallel strand on the uh, right. Here we have a fork functor forking two strand into two one strands and a string on the left. So these two little things uh, are uh, must uh, give skin triangulation. These two functors must be spherical, basically, which amounts uh, to, uh, in fact, asking everything sort of uh, for these two copies of two representations of GBR2 you get to be also skin triangulated. So uh, now we proceed to something that really exists only in the world of three strands. Firstly, there are two new crossings we have to define. And the answer is that uh, you draw this, um, you take this functor, which is a composition of uh, a fork, uh, two one to one 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 fork, and uh, a merge of one 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 in the opposite direction uh, into, sorry, uh, this is wrong. It should be one two here, of course. Uh, and similarly, you take a merge from two one into three and a fork from three into one two. It turns out that there exists a natural morphism between them. And we uh, can describe this morphism. Indeed, if I get to last slide, you will sort of see, uh, well, second slide before the end, you will see sort of an example of uh, how these morphisms are obtained. And then you simply take a cone of this, uh, of this morphism and then you get this crossing. And similarly, uh, and this is a skin, and this is a skin relation. It tells you that this uh, uh, 
crossing has to be a cone of this natural morphism between these compositions of forks and merges. And similarly for uh, the, other, uh, the, the other crossing of this type. So, uh, I mean, the picture here is completely symmetrical. And now we get, uh, so then we get to ribbon twist. I mean, uh, there should be a ribbon, to, uh, you, you know, from this condition, we obtain the ribbon twists of sort of, of multiplicity two ribbons, but we also have to know how to twist multiplicity three ribbon. And the answer is this, you get, uh, uh, only now cones are no longer enough because, so we start dealing with convolutions. Uh, should I explain what the convolution of a complex is? Uh, or do, are people here mostly familiar with this? Maybe if you say a few words, how this picture, yeah. what does this picture mean at least? Right, so, um, I mean, firstly, I mean, here I have a functor, a functor and a morph and a natural morphism between. So here I have three functors. I have uh, sort of a functor here. Uh, I have uh, two functors here and I have a functor here. And uh, I take natural morphisms like this. So uh, what I obtain uh, is essentially in a, uh, in a category of functors between my uh, triangulated categories. Uh, I mean, this functor is represented by a bimodule, this functor is represented by a module, by a bimodule. I take a functor which is represented by a direct sum of these bimodules. So, uh, so in the end, I end up with three objects in, uh, Enhanced triangulated category of functors between uh, the category uh, in this case uh, from and the functors of the category uh, what I call C three the category I uh, represent uh, this endpoint configuration with and now I take a convolution of this complex what is a convolution uh, right let me just quickly do this um, suppose I have if I have two objects and a morphism between them, I can take a cone. So this star means that this is an exact triangle. Suppose I have three objects and two morphisms between them. What I can do is then I can take a cone here and then if alpha and beta compose to zero, then I can always lift beta to a morphism beta dash here, which makes this commute. And then I can take uh, a cone of beta dash now and uh, obtain an object, which I will call the convolution of this complex. Notice that uh, I can have different choices of beta dash. So the uh, object E depends on this choice of beta dash. Moreover, what I could have done is I could have taken a cone here first. Uh, and then lifted alpha to alpha dash. And then I could have taken a cone here. And what I, what I would have taken, obtained would also be uh, a convolution uh, of this complex. So, uh, Normally, if you're working in a triangulated category, then uh, a complex uh, of objects uh, with morphism between them, which is differential, so uh, composition of any two adjacent morphisms uh, is zero, may not have any convolution at all, because you know, if, uh, if I now had another object here, then uh, this lift is guaranteed, but a complex uh, of four objects is already, is already not guaranteed to have a convolution. And the convolution is certainly not unique. However, if you, if you work in, not in triangulated categories, but enhanced triangulated categories, all the stuff is, is, is constructed on DG level. So in fact, I'm not talking about a complex, I'm talking about a twisted complex. And twisted complex uh, is, is, firstly, it projects to a genuine complex in the homotopy category, 
but the higher differentials provide you with exactly the information of how to take uh, sort of which cones to take and which uh, and how to choose the lifts between them. So somehow twisted complex comes with a prescribed convolution. And uh, but roughly, if you if somebody is listening to this who's never uh, seen this before. Convolution should be thought of as a sort of this generalization of a cone where uh, I sort of have a three complex. So I take a cone of one morphism and then replace the two objects and the morphism between them by the cone and lift sort of the two adjacent morphisms uh, to this cone. And then proceed uh, to sort of to like this until I have just two guys left and I take a cone of a morphism between them. So this is a highly non-unique procedure which is not even guaranteed to exist uh, except uh, that when you work on the DG level and if you have a twisted complex to start with, which we do, uh, you are you, you you are guaranteed to have uh, convolution and this. Actually, I can't hear you. It's my problem or? Not yours. It's a general problem. Mm -hmm. Same for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's not so much. Timothy, you hear us? You can go to the other side of the room and ask. Is he there? Судя по виду, вначале мне казалось, что он в кабинете. Mm. Сейчас, секунду. Mm. Простите, пожалуйста, это происходит э, иногда, не очень часто. У меня зависает вот так зо, это ровно то, почему я, почему я постоянно спрашиваю. Понятно, понятно. Сейчас я расшир... То есть нужно убить э, второго меня. Ну зачем уж так? Ну это как... Э, у нас уже есть Женя Фейгин У и Женя Фейгин, так сказать... Э, как было у Стругацких? У Янус и А Янус, по-моему. Как-то так, да, да. Да, да. ну вот у нас также и дубли, значит, есть. А дубли, с дублями что-то. У нас один уже переименовался, Женя Македонский. Да. Отлично, сейчас давайте я расширю экран и вернемся сюда. То есть я объяснял, что такое конволюция э, скрученного комплекса э, и э, в какой момент вырубился звук. Ну, собственно, как сказать, более-менее в начале объяснения. А в начале объяснения. То есть э, я уже начал рисовать что-то на экране, когда звук вырубился. Начали, да, начали. Да, да то есть э, если у нас есть, грубо говоря, если у нас есть в триангулированной категории э, любой комплекс с любым количеством объектов, то я могу пробовать взять конус, заменить эти два объекта как бы на Е, что означает реально, что вместо комплекса А, Б, С, Д я рассматриваю комплекс Е, В, С, Д. Это означает, что я всегда должен поднять два соседних дифференциала до конуса. И потом продолжить делать то же самое. 
Это, здесь существует миллион выборов, поэтому у комплекса может не существовать вообще конволюции, может существовать несколько разных конволюций. Но работая в ДЖ, ты работаешь на самом деле не с, не с, не с комплексом объектов трехгрейной категории, а с твистым комплексом объектов в ДЖ категории. А твист комплекс объектов в ДЖ категории – это комплекс в гомотопической категории объектов плюс жестко выбранная уникальная его конволюция. Поэтому, когда я говорю, что конволюция этого комплекса – это автоэквивалентность, я на самом деле имею в виду, что у меня есть естественный комплекс, твист комплекс в ДЖ мире, я беру, я беру его, его, ту его конволюцию, которая ну, задана структурой твиста комплекса. В реальной же жизни, в, когда мы говорим о точных функторах между производными категориями, я всего лишь говорю, что есть какой-то способ взять конус, поднять оставшийся морфизм и продолжать так делать, пока я не получу э, функтор, который будет как бы скруткой всего этого комплекса. Так вот, и что я тоже вырубилось, когда э, вырубился звук. Сейчас проверка, меня слышно по-прежнему? Да, да вас хорошо слышно. Очень хорошо. Тогда э, вырубилось следующее, что до этого момента я не сказал, в общем-то, ну, то есть вот это уже немножко новое, но дав вот эти формулы, я не сказал ничего нового, поскольку на самом деле э, Каутис, Камнис и Рекомпания э, описали в какой-то момент, изучая флопы, нетривиальную производную ковалентность между Гарсманианом и дуальным Гарсманианом. А если, а если подумать, то вот здесь я вам, в, в, в мире флагов, я вам скажу, что вот это вот, это производная категория к касательной к P2, а это касательная к дуальной P2. Грубо говоря, если здесь есть P, а здесь мультиплисти Q, то это Гроссманиан P э, в P плюс Q, а это Гроссманиан, его дуальный Q в P плюс Q. И я вам описываю некую нетривиальную производную эквивалентность э, между производной категорией кокосательного космония и дуальным космонианом. И там, э, собственно говоря, вот это э, ровно те же формулы, которые появляются у них. То есть э, и, где, где ситуация становится интересной и совсем нетривиальной, это вот здесь. Вот. Поскольку я теперь беру еще три, два комплекса, которые тоже получаются из forks, merges и естественных морфизмов между ними, которые приходят из того, что э, forks всегда сопряжены э, к merges, а также multi-fork, multi-merge. Я требую, чтобы, конволюция, чтобы этот комплекс был цикличным, чтобы его конволюция была равна нулю. Его конволюция равна нулю, это на самом деле э, в случае комплекса длиной из трех объектов утверждение, что это, эти три объекта с этим морфизмом точный треугольник производной категории. И мы, к своему удивлению, обнаружили, что у вот этой абстрактной зауми в мире, например, по касательных расслоений к флагам есть очень красивое геометрическое объяснение. То есть этот точный треугольник там происходит не из зауми, а из геометрии. То есть он происходит из того, что если у вас есть приводимое многообразие, то разбив его в любые две компоненты, можно написать структурный пучок приводил многообразия как точный треугольник. Он проецируется э, на одну из компонент, и э, в нем сидит э, структурный пучок другой компоненты с неким пучком, с пучком идеалов первой компоненты на ней. И вот этот классический геометрический точный треугольник, это ровно то, что возникает вот здесь, между forks и merges, э, тем естественными, всем известными производными функторами по, по касательным к флагам. То есть мы, в общем, были удивлены, насколько просто, просто показалось проверить эти relations. А теперь теорема. Теорема, так сказать, следующая. Что пусть у нас есть следующая система, то есть вот это мы называем, это наше определение, так сказать, того, что представление является с кем триангулированным GBR3, если все оснащенные триангулированной категории, они с кем триангулированы в отношении GBR2, и э, вот эти кроссинги э, отвечают вот таким условиям. Э, ribbon twist э, получается из force не очень таким образом. И есть два точных треугольника. Рафей, я прошу прощения, можно вопрос? Да. А, значит, вот вы упомянули про аналогию с гроссманианами, да? Да. да. Это используется для доказательства или это как бы такая путеводная нить? А, 
Нет, для вот, вот это доказательство, это чисто доказательство существующее. То есть в каком-то смысле можно показать, то есть сейчас, аналогия с гроссманианами, это я говорил, что у нас есть два, два семейства примеров представления Джабар Эн. Да. Мы даже не знаем, мы не можем, мы даже не, не имеем определения пока что, что такое scale triangulated в случае э, GBRN. Но вот у нас есть э, некая коллекция э, геометрических э, форт функторов между кукасательными к флагам и гроссманиан это часть этой системы. Э, и э, мы знаем, что вот то, что мы хотим называть scale triangulated, это ровно вот это. То есть мы в конце мы пишем наше определение, внимательно изучая то, что происходит. То есть для нас путеводной нитью да, является то, что происходит на кокосательных флагах и гроссманианах соответственно. То есть, например, в, то есть утверждение, которое так сказать, можно проверить на флагах, что если взять, я, я пишу на следующей странице, как выглядят форк функторы потом, может, если взять их сопряженные, написать вот этот комплекс и взять его конволюцию, то получишь нетривиальная э, производная эквивалентность между гроссманианом и дуальным гроссманианом. То есть это, э, это как бы... Э, у, то есть для того, чтобы доказать... Заметьте, что для того, чтобы доказать, что у нас есть скейн Трэнглейт представление GBRN на флагах, нам нужно будет посчитать эти конволюции и показать, что они действительно дают нетривиальные производные эквивалентности. Например, это уже было сделано в августе Каунсе в случае... Э, в, в, в случае всех, всех этих кроссов. То есть то, что они эквивалентности, как бы, и то, что эти эквивалентности существуют, только они получаются известны. То, что между ними, все отношения к остальные, которые между ними существуют, ни в коем случае не известны. Так вот, теорема. Если у нас есть четыре э, оснащенных производных категорий и э, четыре э, форк-функтора между ними, Такие, что у них у всех есть левые сопряженные, э, такие, что э, вот эти два функтора индуцируют представление GBR2, то есть э, э, так же, как наверху, то есть они просто сферические. Э, конволюции э, вот этих комплексов – это автоэквалентности, то есть у нас есть ribbon twist и два кроссинга, и конволюции вот этих комплексов ацикличны, то вся эта система индуцирует, то есть определяя кроссинги, используя вот эти формулы, и ribbon twist, используя вот эту формулу, мы получаем скейн триангулированное представление GBA3. То есть удивительная вещь, что вот эти два ацикличных штуки нужны, чтобы то, что мы сгенерировали из форк функторов, определяя кроссинги вот так, а мерджи, как их сопряженные, действительно удовлетворяло вот этому ужасному списку generalized braid relations и являлось представлением топологической модели, о которой мы говорили. То есть, если в экземпле, в примере с GBR2 у нас не было вот этих как бы условий, у нас мы как бы знали там, что если у нас есть функция, если у нас есть если у функции и твист, и код твист, автоэквалентность, то все остальное уже следует, то здесь это уже не так. Но, то есть, мы имеем две как бы вещи. Определение того, что такое скейн трендовое представление, и это же определение одновременно является условием на форк функтор Фактически можно рассматривать это определение как, то есть, две стороны этого определения. Одно. У вас уже есть категорное представление GBR3, вы хотите знать, является ли оно скейм триангулированным. Тогда вот условия, которые должны выполнять. Второй вариант. У вас есть вот эти категории четыре функтора. Тогда это определение говорит вам, что вот это должно быть автоэквалентностью, вот это должно быть автоэквалентностью, вот это должно быть автоэквалентностью, это должно быть цикличным, это должно быть цикличным. И если это так, то определяя при помощи автоэквалентности все остальные функторы в GBR3, вы получите ее представление, которое будет удовлетворять всем соотношениям между этими генераторами. То есть это то, что мы хотим видеть в общем случае также. Определение Scheme Triangulated 
представление GBRN должно сопровождаться теоремой, которая говорит, что если есть four filter, для которых одна куча комплексов будет циклична, а другая куча комплексов будет автоэквалентностями, то э, используя автоэквалентность, чтобы определить э, все кроссинги э, и ribbon твисты э, мы получим представление GBRN. Это как бы... Э, смысл программы. Давайте, я все-таки хочу закончить э, в 7, э, поэтому э, давайте я быстро э, расскажу остальное. Э, есть... а я, я, я прошу прощения, а, а вы, э, но опять же, полностью на ваше усмотрение, да. но, а, если вы хотите как бы, не, рассказать подробнее, то мы будем рады еще раз вас послушать. Ну, на самом деле можно, то есть э, э, да, я... Э... Просто я смотрю, тут есть довольно содержательные вещи, очень содержательные, и в принципе, то есть, как бы, нет, в принципе, если вы хотите... Да, можете... На самом деле можно... Э, да, да, давайте я тогда просто скажу, э, в завершение скажу, что у нас есть как бы два семейства примеров, э, что мы изучали сколько, два примера. Одна категорная э, алгебра Нильгеки на сгенерированное N брейдящимися эквивалентностями над категорией C. То есть, если у нас есть, как бы, если у нас есть категория C и N брейдящихся автоэквивалентности над ней, то я утверждаю, что мы можем написать категорную алгебру, не ли алгебру Геке над ней, и дальше будет такая штука, что вот в примере N равно 3 у нас изначальная категория есть наша категория С вот здесь, мы начинаем с категории С и в нашем случае двух автоэквивалентностей. Мы используем их, чтобы записать категорию нельгеки алгебры, категорию С3. Все остальные категории соответствуют неким естественным подалгебрам этой категории нельгеки алгебры. И функтора между ними это просто будет ограничение и индукция скаляров поскольку у нас есть вложение одной алгебры в другую, а значит, у нас есть два сопряженных функта ограничения и, так сказать, индукции скаляров. И вся система, которая этого получается, будет с кем предъявлять представление NGBRN. А второе – это изначальная сеть функторов между кокосательными на флагах, которую мы изучали вот с 2010 года, за которую мы сели, не совсем ожидая, на какой гроб мы замахнулись. И давайте тогда действительно, поскольку сейчас уже долгий доклад был, если интересно, я с удовольствием расскажу подробнее про эти два примера. А также в конце расскажу, собственно говоря, про то, что за естественные морфизмы существуют между форками и мерчами, и откуда берутся те комплексы, которые я писал, то есть как бы, <coughs> чтобы определить GBR2 и GBR3. Замечательно. Женя, Игорь, а мы уже договаривались с докладчиком на следующий раз или еще нет? Ну, да, мы же обсуждали. Что? На следующий раз, да, но вроде Андрей будет продолжать. Жень, вы уже с Андреем договаривались? Или как? Да. Хорошо, а тогда, Тимофей, а если через неделю вам Эту удобно? Через неделю будет? отлично, с удовольствием. Значит, у нас сегодня у нас 12, да, то есть 26, да, получается? Да. Здорово, спасибо. Отлично. Еще, Жень, нормально так? Ну, да. 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 Угу. Отлично. То есть у нас, получается, будут два доклада с разницей две недели. По-моему, нормально. А, Б, А, Б. Чтобы держать Да, структура рифмы А, Б, А, Б. Да, все правильно. Хорошо, Тимофей, большое спасибо. Спасибо большое, что, так сказать, внимательно послушали. Всегда приятно рассказывать доклад. Может быть, еще какие-нибудь вопросы остались? Да. Ну, и, я так понимаю, это история про тип А, если мы, да, да. как я это понял, если мы вместо индукции на да. маленькую параболическую, и мы на маленькую параболическую. Да, да. да. ну, ситуация, да, да. Это, это, в общем-то, именно про это. Вопрос, который немедленно возникает, это что делать вне типа А, ответ там будет что-то похожее, но, возможно, без такой гим топологической простой как бы, структуры. Мы как бы в данном случае мы хотим понять типа, прежде чем, так сказать, может быть, там внуки наших учеников разберутся, что делать с другими типами. Может быть, B2 проще, чем общий тип А? 
Вряд ли. Ну, это как бы опыт показывает, что нет. Хотя вот Сережа Ахитов, который, может быть, еще слушает этот доклад. Слушай, слушай. Так вот, он нашел прекрасное геометрическое доказательство, так сказать, как доказать, что есть... Как, как, как бы, вот те самые категорные, то есть внутри представления general, обобщенных коз сидит представление обычных коз. И там как бы их, то есть там ты как бы вместо того, чтобы делать с тем, что мы называем forks and merges, ты просто сразу забываешь про них и общаешься только с пересечением. Но там достаточно простенькие сферические функторы. То есть, но, но эти, эти самые в, в классическом действии, так сказать, Хованова Томаса, которые потом изучали безрукавников и Риш, а, там эти самые функторы, которые а, сопоставляются кроссингом, они являются сферическими твистами. То есть это как бы часть нашей истории, так сказать, достаточно маленькая. Но вот а, сначала безрукавников и Риш написали, доказали, что Похожие сферические функторы существуют на чисто э, языке теории представлений э, в, э, в случае всех остальных, э, не только в случае, а в, в, в абсолютно общем случае всех полупростых алгебрей. И э, доказали это там очень сложным методом через характеристику P. А вот Сережа Архипов э, с, с авторами э, придумали э, красивое геометрическое э, доказательство того, что это самое вот, действие просто группы КОС э, э, существует э, для э, всех э, типов э, указательных к э, э, флагам. И там э, так, что э, возможно э, нашу историю когда-нибудь тоже можно будет э, по-человечески обобщить на, э, за пределы типа А. Спасибо. Еще какие-нибудь вопросы? Хорошо, если нет, то большое спасибо. Я останавливаю запись. Спасибо большое.